Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'll just wait a few seconds um, while people enter the webinar, and then and then we'll get started with our presentation for today. All right, I think we'll get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fiona McDonald. I'm Events and Communications Lead at the Invasive Species Council of British Columbia. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm joining you today from the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, tsleil and Squamish Nations, also known as Vancouver. Uh, we're very excited to be joined today by Na Naomi Nickel, um, who will be presenting on invasive rabbits uh, for us. Before we begin with that, just a few uh, tech checks um, for those joining us today so that you can have the best webinar experience. Um, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen where you can uh, pop in your questions for Naomi. Um, and the, at the end of her presentation, we'll have a Q&A period and a moderated discussion. There's also the chat box. Um, and while I go through these details, I welcome you to pop into the chat box, let us know who you are and where you are joining us from. Um, the best way to view today's webinar to ensure that um, you're seeing what you need to see, there's a button in the top right of your screen that says view. Um, I suggest the side-by-side -side speaker. Um, and uh, if you don't know this, Zoom's recent updates means that you can drag uh, the video and the screen back and forth so that either the screen becomes larger or the video becomes larger. Um, if you're having any technical issues at any point during today's webinar, please just pop your question into the chat box and my colleague Jana is available to assist you. So without further ado, um, Naomi is a registered biologist with a master's degree in wildlife management and a 25 year career in wildlife and ecosystem conservation. She has lived and worked all over North America and in Europe and spent a lot of her career focusing on how our legislative frameworks affect outcomes on the landscape and how we can improve those. Uh, currently, Naomi is working in the policy and legislative reform team that oversees the Wildlife Act and its associated policies and procedures. She is a part of a team assessing various issues with the Act and will be involved in amendments moving forward, including those that affect our ability to manage more invasive species. Uh, Naomi lives in Brentwood Bay, BC, and I did forget to say that she's a senior policy analyst with the Fish and Wildlife Branch of the Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development, also known as Monroe. Uh, without any, uh, any further comments, Naomi, welcome, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Fiona, and uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, like Fiona said, I, I am a wildlife biologist with uh, an interest in policy and legislation um, because I do see opportunities uh, through our legislation to improve conservation outcomes on the landscape. So I am relatively new to the invasive rabbit file. Um, a lot of the work I'm gonna discuss today has been accomplished by my team members and others that have moved on to other positions. Um, but invasive species touch um, all aspects of conservation and wildlife management. It's hard to get away from this issue. So I was interested to dig into this file. Um, and I'll also discuss sort of some of the changes that government is considering um, or has put forward to try and improve our management of rabbits in BC. So when we say invasive rabbits, um, it holds various meanings for, for different people. Some people refer to wild rabbits or native rabbits or feral rabbits uh, or European rabbits. And so the discussion around invasive rabbits in BC is gonna specifically be on schedule C rabbits. And I'll discuss what that means. Um, that's a term we use under the Wildlife Act and it's specific to certain species and it comes with management implications for those species. So in BC, um, our non-native rabbits are listed under Schedule C. So I just want to clarify terminology so that we all understand what we're talking about. So 
what are Schedule C rabbits? So one of the species um, that is under Schedule C, one of the rabbit species is the Eastern Cottontail Rabbit. These are native to North America. They're native to Northern North America. Um, and they were introduced onto Vancouver Island and that little map shows um, their distribution sort of in Northwest Washington, Lower Mainland in BC um, and on Vancouver Island. Where I live, north of Victoria, um, this is the species that we are grappling with in terms of, you know, getting into our gardens and whatnot. Um, and so, and and they look very much like they are, as if they are a native rabbit. They don't appear any different than you would expect a native rabbit to appear, but they are non-native rabbits. The other rabbits that are on Schedule C are the European rabbits. And these are often what people consider when they think about um, invasive rabbits. These are the ones we see um, in a lot of parks and um, University of Victoria campus. Um, they are uh, often non-brown rabbits, although they can be brown as well, but they can be black. You think of pet rabbits. These are the rabbits that people keep as pets that often are shown in 4-H clubs. Um, and they were introduced um, probably as meat rabbits. Um, they came over with settlers and like a lot of invasive species, they, um, you know, they may have been brought over to remind people of their homeland Europe. So um, these ones are very adaptable. They are raised for meat. Um, and like I said, kept for pets. Um, and the Eastern cottontails don't tend to be kept as pets. These are the ones that tend to be kept as pets and unfortunately released uh, into the wild. So people often ask, what about native rabbits? So are we confusing, you know, is it easy to confuse our native rabbits with these uh, Schedule C rabbits? So BC does have native rabbits. Vancouver Island does not have any native rabbits. So any rabbit that is seen on Vancouver Island is a Schedule C rabbit. Um, we have a Nettles cottontail, which looks very much like the Eastern cottontail. Um, and fortunately, their ranges don't overlap. The Nettles cottontails are found in the Okanagan. And currently we don't have Eastern cottontails in the Okanagan. Um, we have white-tailed jackrabbits, which are very rare and are red listed as endangered in British Columbia. And then we have the snowshoe hare, which is actually listed as a pest species um, in the Wildlife Act. And they're found everywhere in like all over BC and um, not on Vancouver Island or the Gulf Islands, but everywhere else. Um, and so these are the three native rabbits in British Columbia. So why are Schedule C rabbits a problem? Um, one of the biggest problems is that they're rabbits and all rabbits have really high reproductive rates. They can up to have up to five, they reproduce young, start reproducing when they're very young, four months old. They can have up to five litters a year, multiple bunnies in each litter. Um, and so their numbers just increase at a, a really rapid rate when they are living in an area that is conducive. Um, they do burrow and their burrows undermine ecosystems, they undermine infrastructure, they undermine foundations and, um, and they can disrupt water flow and certainly they disrupt ecosystems as well. Um, and not just the burrows, but they're, they are very heavy grazers. And so in areas that are not adapted to rabbits, um, they, the plants are not adapted to being grazed on at the rate at which rabbits graze. And so they are very destructive to native plants, ecosystems, and anyone who lives where there are rabbits, very destructive to gardens as well. So a little bit about what Schedule C means. So a schedule under the Wildlife Act is basically just a list. And it's a list of species that form a group and help us manage according to that group. So the Wildlife Act has five different schedules of wildlife. Um, a Schedule A is native wildlife that is not um, 
of management concern. Um, schedule B is native wildlife, but wildlife that is considered a pest species. So that includes raccoons, snowshoe hares, skunks, there are many other species on that list. But it allows us, for example, to write a policy that applies to Schedule B. And we can just say Schedule B. And in that way, it applies to all animals on that list to be managed in a certain way. Uh, Schedule C is non-native wildlife. So these are pest species that are not native um, and they are managed differently. And some examples are gray squirrels, uh, bullfrogs, European rabbits, Eastern cottontail rabbits, um, Norway rats. There are many species of wildlife that are on Schedule C. Schedule D wildlife is native but threatened. Um, and there's only one species in that list, the sea otter. And then Schedule E is endangered species. Um, and there are three, sorry, yeah, three species on that list. And so unfortunately, by naming specific species on these lists, in order to add a species, for example, if we had a new invasive species in British Columbia, it requires an amendment to the regulation. And that is a time consuming process. So I'll explain a little bit um, as we go on. Um, and so it would be, um, it's definitely desirable to simplify the process to move animals on and off these lists so that um, we can get at their management faster and not have to wait several years of having an invasive species in the province before they are added to a specific list. So what does it mean for species on Schedule C? Um, what it means is that you do not need um, a hunting license to capture or kill them. Um, you do it, they are, uh, they can be captured or killed in any season. A lot of the other schedules have seasons associated with them. We think of deer hunting, for example, you can only do that in certain seasons. You need a hunting license to do it. You don't need that for Schedule C animals. Um, you do need permission to move them, for example, to if you trap them and you wanted to transport them to a rescue center, you would need a permit to do that. Um, and you are allowed to release them in BC um, under certain circumstances. And those are some of the changes that I'm going to talk about today. Um, any cruelty to any animal in BC is against the law. So regardless of whether or not these are pest species and they're non-native or whatever, it is not allowable to, um, to be cruel in any way. So capture and kill requires humane circumstances. So the Wildlife Act is an old piece of legislation. It was written, um, Different pieces were written at different times, but for the most part, it has not been updated in 40 years. And some of the regulations are newer than that, but really the statute as a whole um, is problematic because it was written at a time where many things were not a problem or in existence or part of the um, considerations around the act, including reconciliation, which is a big um, factor in wildlife management. And the act is written in a way that makes reconciliation difficult in a lot of circumstances. Some of the policies and regulations in the act are in conflict with each other. So when we write a regulation and then the policy that sits under that should clarify that regulation, it does not in many cases or it conflicts. And it leaves decision makers in a place where it's unclear um, what legal standing they have to make some of their decisions. Um, and so um, the province has committed to reviewing the Wildlife Act and updating it. And the scope of that review and update is still in question. Um, cabinet is considering their options but um, it really does require a strategic approach to ensure that um, we improve wildlife management across the board in BC. So there were recent 
amendments uh, put forth to cabinet uh, for the um, designation and exemption regulation, which is where Schedule C rabbits, Schedule C animals sit. And so the scope of that, those updates um, were reduced for just to simplify the process to facilitate removal of rabbits from the land, um, facilitate their transport by somebody who did not trap them. Um, currently you need a permit to do that and also uh, prevent their release back into the wild. So that was the scope of the small amendment to the regulation that were put forward this year. There are other areas that need to be addressed. For example, you know, the legislation itself, um, limiting the possession and import of rabbits um, and the, the regulatory approach we take to managing Schedule C animals requires quite a, a large overhaul. And those will be captured in the considerations under to um, amend the Wildlife Act as a whole. So currently um, under the Wildlife Act, it is permissible to capture rabbits, Schedule C rabbits on your own land or with permission of the landowner um, and release or relocate within one kilometer on Vancouver Island and 10 kilometers in the rest of BC. Um, this is problematic for a lot of reasons. The permit requirements needed to, for example, if I trapped a rabbit on my land, if I wanted to transfer it to somebody to take to a, um, a wildlife care center, I, I need a permit to do that because they are not the ones who trap them. Um, we wanted to remove some of the red tape just to facilitate removing rabbits from the landscape. And so the amendments that are put, put forward to cabinet are that, um, first of all, you, you can no longer uh, relocate or release Schedule C rabbits. If they are captured on the landscape, they do not go back into the wild. They're either uh, euthanized um, or adopted out as a pet um, or taken care of in a, in a wildlife center. They can't be released. And this, makes it easier for enforcement so that an, enforce, an enforcement officer, if they see somebody releasing a rabbit, they automatically know that they are breaking the law. Whereas before there were all these caveats, well, is it on your own land? How far are you from where you trapped it? Um, it really makes it complicated to enforce this. Um, the, other, uh, the other amendments that have gone forward to cabinet so currently, um, rabbits not born and raised in captivity, um, like I said, may only be possessed, transported, trafficked, imported, and exported by a person that has trapped the animal themselves. So it's basically once you trap an animal, it is in your ownership, and it is only you who can do any of those things. And the changes will allow the removal of that permit condition so that if I trap a rabbit, I can hand it off to whoever I need to, um, who will take care of it and keep it off the landscape. Um, the second one, like I said, is removing that permit requirement uh, for municipalities or other groups um, to do, to cull rabbits, to, to go out in large scale, trap them um, and either euthanize them or rehome them. Um, and for rehab centers that receive rabbits from somebody to go ahead and rehome them. All of this was tied up in um, permit requirements. Um, sometimes multiple permits would be needed to go through a process like this. And those permit requirements have been removed in the amendments. Um, and again, uh, yeah, removes the red tape to facilitate rabbits being removed from the wild and increases the ability to enforce the regulation. So again, um, we want to facilitate removal from the land. Um, easy, it, and it will be easier to enforce. Um, the, these amendments have, um, have been proposed and they are waiting, um, 
they're waiting approval. So they've they've they're going through the government process, and and hopefully soon they'll they'll be um, they'll be adopted. Obviously, to handle the if the Schedule C rabbit problem in BC, this isn't enough to just facilitate the removal from the landscape. Um, so we do need uh, statutory regulatory amendments and policy updates to all you know that legislative piece of rabbit management. Education and outreach is really key. Um, this is a key piece because people do um, get rabbits as pets. They breed rabbits. If you think of 4-H clubs, I can go to my local country fair in the summer and I can buy a young rabbit from somebody and that rabbit does not come with um, instructions or uh, probably care instructions, but not any information around, if I don't want the rabbit anymore, what do I do? Um, and, you know, pet rabbits are let go into the wild. People think, I think that they're still sort of wild animals and they can survive out there. So that education and outreach is really key. And we need comprehensive planning, a plan for what is it that the province is planning to do around this species? Where do we want to be in five years? What do we need to get there? That, that kind of planning. And we also need more support for anyone who um, is brought a rabbit, rehab centers, wildlife centers, veterinarians. There's a financial burden and an educational burden that comes along with receiving rabbits from people. And so some support for those groups, I think is really needed to improve management on the landscape. And so just to emphasize, so these pet rabbits, um, which are mostly the European rabbits that people keep as pets, they are not wild rabbits. And they have been um, sort of promoted that way. And so it's sort of, um, it leads people to believe that they can let them go in the wild and be okay. Um, some education around keeping rabbits as pets are very difficult and expensive to keep as pets. These are intelligent animals and um, the, you know, the caging in the backyard isn't an ideal life for them. Um, keeping them in the house is not an ideal life for the owner. And so they actually are not ideal pets for families. They're the third most popular pet in the US and they're the third most abandoned pet in the US. A lot of these, what we call European rabbits, even though they're wild in Europe, the ones we have here um, as pets have had their wild traits bred out of them. They are not fearful. They do not have, even though their coats feel soft, they are not as dense as a wild rabbits are. They're bred into white and black and colors that are not camouflage. So when you put a rabbit like that into the wild, they're ill-equipped to survive. They also have reduced inst instincts to find food, water, shelter. When they're let go, they're very susceptible to disease. Um, and so ultimately, you know, rabbits that have been bred in captivity and let go into the wild tend to suffer um, sort of a slow, painful death. They don't tend to survive. The European rabbits we see um, that are living in the wild are often have been born into the wild from some that have survived. Um, but generally a pet let go into the wild is not going to survive. Rabbits also elicit an emotional response. They are cute and people do want them as pets because they are soft and they have a social instinct that is conducive to pets. Um, and so we require a nuanced approach when we try and manage an invasive species that has these characteristics. Uh, education, of course, is key. Um, and also key to letting people know why they need to be removed from the landscape, which is conservation, conservation of native ecosystems, plants, um, all of that, they don't belong out there. Um, and, you know, they, they need a different approach because I have a picture of a bullfrog here that elicits a different response when people find out that they're being removed from the wild. 
Same with zebra mussels. We have drain and dry stations all over the province where zebra mussels are scraped off of boats. Um, and that doesn't el elicit the same response in the public as rabbits being culled from a university campus. And so it, rabbits do need a, a delicate approach to accommodate for that um, emotional response that people have to them. So um, essentially, uh, you know, any invasive species management requires understanding the diversity of opinions about that species. Um, and this way we can avoid, we can't avoid controversial conversations, but we can be empathetic to those different voices and opinions and um, come up with approaches that are um, a little more palatable than, um, than others. And it's, it's very important that we do that. Um, when public opinion isn't considered and when these emotional responses aren't considered, then there's resistance and we're undermining the conservation that we're trying to achieve. So organizations like Invasive Species Council of BC is really fundamental to getting the word out and educating people around the realities of invasive species and messaging those goals of conservation. And um, the other side of that is government has a really large role to play, not just in the legislative pieces of invasive species management, but also in the support of others that are trying to help us manage invasive species. And thank you, that's the end of the webinar. Thank you so much, Naomi, that was very interesting. And I was, uh, I was telling Naomi before this webinar started that I, I just, I have very little knowledge on all of um, the legislation and policy surrounding this issue. So I was learning as well today. Um, so thank you for that. When I, um, a few years ago, I moved from Ontario to BC and I saw my first rabbits. We have rabbits in Ontario too, but they were like truly bunnies in the sense of the world, word, right? Like they were cute. They were white. They didn't look that different from the one you have on the screen currently. Mm -hmm. And I panicked. I was looking around. I'm like, who's brought their pet rabbit to the park? Like, I need to find the owner. This must be a mistake. It must have gotten loose. And then I said that to someone. And they're like, oh, just you wait. Just you wait. You'll you'll start to see them see them around. Um, and yeah, since then I've just uh, now I notice them everywhere I go. Yeah. Um, we have a we have a question in the chat box. Um, that I've been wondering about too. The proposed amendments would allow for the public to capture and keep cottontails. They're not suitable pets because are the cottontails in the same category as what we're calling the European rabbits? We can't, surely we can't be bringing cottontails home. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. So um, cottontails are, they are schedule C rabbits. So they're not European rabbits, but they're under the same schedule in terms of non-native and base of species. And they're different from European rabbits in that they haven't been bred to be pets. So they are much more of a wild rabbit than a European rabbit would be. Although a lot of the European rabbits that we see are probably generations in the wild now. Um, and so likely wouldn't make wonderful pets either. But um, but it would not be illegal to capture and keep a cottontail rabbit as a pet. You don't need a permit for that. I highly don't, I highly recommend against it um, because they, they wouldn't likely be um, very happy being in captivity like that. They are, they are wild rabbits, even though they're, they're non-native. Um, but yeah, they, it would not be against the law to do that. That's interesting. I'm a little, I'm a little taken aback by it. It just, uh, yeah, it doesn't seem intuitive, right? And, and I guess, like you said, um, organizations like ISCBC or other invasive species associations across the country, or across British Columbia, um, I guess that has to be part of the education, right? Um, yeah, different rabbits are suited for different lifestyles. Yeah. And and really, future Wildlife Act amendments. Um, hopefully will address who keeps non-native species in captivity. 
um, we regulate who keeps tigers, right? You can't just have a tiger. And so, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to, um, like for 4-H clubs, for example, to be in a group that has permission to keep these animals under special circumstances, but that they aren't all, um, you know, to be kept without any sort of oversight. That would be, that would probably be a good amendment to, to the regulation around invasive species, yeah. Right, okay. Um, another question that we have here um, to clarify, if release will be illegal, but giving to wildlife centers is legal, will the centers have the capacity and the, will they be allowed to rehabilitate and release? Will they be able to do that if we're not able to? Yeah, rehab centers will not be able to release. And this is where support for centers uh, and vets and others that receive rabbits is really necessary because you're right, they probably won't have the capacity to receive all the rabbits that they might be receiving, particularly now that you don't need a permit to transport that rabbit. And if it's illegal to release it, they, they will likely see an increase in volume and will need support, uh, financial and other uh, resources to try and handle those numbers. But no, they won't be able to release them. They'll either have to rehome them, um, keep them, keep them in a wildlife center somewhere, an educational center, or have them humanely euthanized. Right, and, and that uh, there's another question in the box here that uh, kind of goes to, um, what you're saying just now, like where will all these rabbits go? You just answered that, but um, you know, I'm sure that will cause significant issues with the public um, yeah. and communication. You know, I'm, I'm, I would be upset by that. I am upset by that. So, um, what do you have comments on that? On how we can educate the public? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a difficult situation because nobody wants to think about um, culling animals that we think of as pets. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's sort of a terrible situation that we all find ourselves in and these animals find themselves in. And so it is a big, um, challenge for education and, and also to maintain that humane kind approach to all the animals, um, you know, whatever their fate. And, you know, there are some animals that, that, may survive in captivity, but don't thrive in captivity. And so there is a question there around what is best for them? What is the kind approach we can take with them? Um, and a lot of these, you know, that if you, if you saw, you know, a lop-eared bunny that was clearly somebody's pet out in the wild, that's gonna be a, a slow, painful death for that animal. So there is a kindness there too for removing it and either rehoming it or, you know, but, but being in the wild is not the, um, the beneficial living situation for all animals. You know, we wouldn't release our pet dogs into the wild thinking that they will be happier there. That is not a good solution for them. So it's not a good solution for rabbits either. Yeah, it is, it is quite interesting that rabbits have developed this like um you know uh, urban legends around them like like we understand that with dogs and cats and um other pets but with rabbits like I remember growing up with that too like oh yeah it would be no problem for this rabbit to be able to I wonder at what point that got lost the idea that they are like these intelligent um codependent pets right I'm not sure when that uh, dropped off yeah, and, and we don't have wild dogs. I mean, we have, you know, coyotes and wolves, but we don't have wild dogs running around the way you see a, a wild rabbit. I mean, a native wild rabbit. And so maybe it's that they still look like <laughs> the wild animals that we see around and we assume that they would be okay in that situation. Um, and they're not. Yeah, another yeah. comment here, um, back to the cottontails, is that if the rehab centers also are not able to release them into the wild, could they release the cotton cottontails back? No. 
not no rabbits. Cottontails are also Schedule C right. animals, okay. and you cannot release them under the new regulation. Um, and those amendments have not gone through yet, um, but um, there are rules around the release. And in practice, even though legally, yeah, you, you know, right now we we can. In practice, most organizations do not release rabbits into the wild. Like they, it's not a practice that you know. It's sort of understood that a non-native pest would not be released, even though technically, um, right now it's legal. Soon it won't be, and that goes for cottontails as well. Yeah. Wow. And so this is a big question. Not to put you on the spot, <laughs> um, but take your time. I'm just like, what is your, given your expertise and your background, what is your hope for the future? What is the ultimate solution if there is one? Um, yeah, that is, it's a tough question. Um, my hope would be that um, we would take you know, sort of that multi-pronged approach. We would make legislative change that really regulates who can keep uh, non-native species as pets and have proper education around that, but also the framework in place for what happens to animals when they are no longer, you know, a lot of people have to rehome their pets. That is, or their, any animal that they keep that's just part of it. And so we need a framework in place of like options of where that animal can go. What is a humane way to deal with it? Who can keep them alive? Maybe we have centers that do that. I don't know. Um, but I think that since they're fairly localized, the Schedule C rabbits, um, I would love to see a large scale effort to remove them, educate the public not to let your rabbits go and start to sort of get the situation under control from a conservation perspective. If we can address these, you know, pockets of populations. Do you know if there's anywhere else in the world that is experiencing a similar oh, yeah. rabbits? European rabbits are found on every continent. Wow. Only Antarctica, I think, doesn't have them. Australia has been battling rabbits forever. Um, they are, this is a very common problem. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, if we manage to get a handle on it anytime soon in BC, it would be wonderful. But, um, but it is a universal, they are a universal problem. They're everywhere. Yeah. There's an, there's an interesting comment in, in the chat here about uh, the mental health impact of these people working in the rehab centers. And, and I think actually that would be a very compelling education tool, right? To, to reach those people that may not be able to um, associate with the rap or get in the mindset of the pet side and the rabbit side of it, but perhaps the impacts on the, the worker side of it and that compassion for, for our neighbors and for our people working in these rehab centers. Yeah, and people work in rehab centers because they're animal lovers. Mm -hmm. I became a biologist because I'm an animal lover. And so it would be very difficult to see the situations that, you know, and the, the conditions some of these rabbits are in when they're brought in and, you know, and then not have options available or the resources available to do the right thing with those rabbits would be very, very, very difficult. I, I really do empathize with um, with the rehab centers and wildlife centers staff. It's a very difficult situation. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's not something I had thought about. It's this, it's the greater impact of invasive mm -hmm. species, which we we do as a, a council speak about economic impacts and um, impacts to our communities. But when getting down to that and the nitty gritty of, uh, of what's actually going on, it's just it's so multifaceted. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so what's next? Uh, what's next for you in this journey? And what's the, uh, yeah, what's next? <laughs> yeah, what's next? Um, well, getting these, these few small amendments through cabinet um, is a, a number one priority on my plate right now. Um, and then 
you know, exploring what, you know, what is possible? What is possible if we opened up the Wildlife Act and we could do whatever we wanted to regulate invasive species? What would that look like? And there's been a lot of work done on this already. I'm not the first person to be asking these questions. Um, and so it's, it's, yeah, it's getting the go ahead to start doing some of those things and then continuing to work on the education side of it. Um, and try and get some organization, more organizations on board, public on board, in terms of um, both helping us find solutions. You know, it takes the village and um, all the all the opinions and solutions and ideas out there. They're all important, and they're all um, they all inform um, what's possible for next steps. Yeah, that's great. Um, we're uh out of questions. So I, uh, I just want to say thank you so much, Naomi, for joining us today and sharing your expertise. Um, I'm, I'm interested to see the progress. I hope progress that is made, uh, made soon on this issue. And, um, and as we always encourage people, if you do uh, see any of these rabbits out and about, uh, please do report them either using the BC Invasives app or even on iNaturalist, the iSpy Unidentify project, all those observations uh, do go towards um, data that's collected so that we can further understand what's happening with these rabbit populations. Um, so thank you so much. This webinar has been recorded. It will be posted within the next day on our YouTube channel and on our website. Um, thank you, Naomi. Thank you very much. Thank you.